Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the chance to be here together, to learn and to grow. We thank you for your presence, the power of your spirit in our lives, the, the power of the word to transform our minds and to renew our minds. So help us today, Lord, to do that, to come together, to grow together, to let our minds be renewed, to um, put every effort into what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to just do a, a, a quick sort of overview of um, the, the homework. And uh, one of the things about the homework is a lot of it is resources. Uh, it's great if you can do the homework that week. It's great if you can continue with that through the, the weeks, through the class. Some of it you may just touch a little bit. Some of it you may devour. And I'm just going to cover a couple of those resources, and then Nathan's going to come up and talk about some other resources. Um, one of the things that we, we had a couple weeks back was building your testimony. And that's definitely not one you're going to do in, a, in one sitting. Because for one, you want to build your testimony that you would share with someone in different situations, different lengths. So sometimes you might have a couple of minutes to just talk to somebody about what God's done in your life. And you can just share that, that testimony or that telling the story of what God's done. And, uh, and so if you don't have a copy of that, I encourage you to come up and I'm going to leave them up here at the end of the class. You can pick up whatever resources you don't have. They're also online. We're recording these and we're putting the materials online. Nathan, how are we doing that? Is it on the website or? The church YouTube channel. Okay, the YouTube it's channel. It's called the One Thing Class. Okay. And uh, Ellen also sends out a reminder with uh, the paperwork is on the website. Okay. So YouTube channel and on the, on the website. Uh, another resource was on the, on the false gospels. If you didn't get that one, that's a good one to, to look at, not just thinking about other people, but also yourself. Where do I fall into this? Where do I fall for this aspect maybe of a false gospel in my own life? Um, and then uh, last week, um, Nathan covered uh, some great material and then handed out the Manifestations of Pride by Stuart Scott and then Manifestations of I think it goes through, but anyway, if you don't have this one, this is a great, you could spend the next six months doing your devotions just on one line a week practically, and this is great stuff. It's a resource. You don't need to consume it all in one sitting. In fact, you probably shouldn't because you won't get that much out of it if you just glance through it. Uh, but there again, looking for things in our own lives from that. Um, and then I uh, also wanted to mention that we're, as far as resources, we want to... Um, send some others around. If you haven't put your email down, it would be great if you could do that. I think most of you have. Because like this week, I was thinking about a particular one on the, on the uh, attributes of God. Uh, Walter's going to talk about our view of God. And um, there's this great website that a guy put together that does the best job I've ever seen of giving you a resource to just think about the different, who God is and what's he like and, and what are his attributes, what are his qualities, what are his characteristics. And uh, you might think of, you know, maybe you're dealing with fear. Well, what is it about God that's true that would help me renew my mind and not be afraid? So that's a great resource. Um, and then just a quick overview of where we're headed. Um, we're in the section right now on, on the, well, first of all, can you guys remember our, our uh, church, I guess it's a mission statement, right? That's what we're, you know. Does anybody know how it starts out? Calling, Calling all people to receive, demonstrate, and declare God's transforming grace through Christ Jesus. And so that those three aspects of receiving, demonstrating, we're in the demonstrating section right now. We'll get to the declare. But today kind of, I feel like today's material covers all three in different ways. If we, if we don't see God, even though we've received Christ and we're being transformed by him, anyway, you'll get more from Walter, so I won't take his time. So um, where we're headed. Uh, so we're on the demonstrate section. Next week, Charlie Solomon will talk about uh, the change priorities, how, how we demonstrate the transforming grace through our changed uh, priorities. And then we'll move into the declare section. And uh, we'll start that one off with uh, some tools for sharing the gospel that Nathan will present. Uh, I'll talk about knowing your circle, knowing the world God's given you, the people God's put in your life. Uh, then Steve's going to talk about the gospel for the long haul, those situations where 
you've got a relative or a loved one or a coworker and they're, you know, you're with them long term and you're praying for them long term. How do you how do you stay energized and how do you focus on that? Um, and then we'll go on to some other. So I'm going to give it over to Nathan now. He's going to share a few more resources. So, like I said, these homework pages are resources that you should have in your library and continue to work on through through time. Thank you. So, last week, you guys remember the three grace breaks? You guys remember what they were? What was the first one? God's opposed to the proud, proud but gives grace to the humble. humble. What was the next one? Idols of the heart, right? They, they forfeit the grace of God that could be theirs because they cling to worthless idols. And then what was the last one? Bitterness, right? See to it that no root of bitterness springs up among you, causing all kinds of trouble. So these are three great uh, books, motives. This is Idols of the Heart, really getting into why you do what you do, what's really motivating you behind there. And hopefully you guys are looking at those questions. I'm going to leave them up here so you guys can take a picture. Pride and Humility, Stuart Scott. I've got to talk to Stuart Scott about all those pride issues and uh, really good resource right here. Look how little that is. Don't be scared. <laughs> and then another good one too is uh, bitterness, the root that pollutes. This is a super good one too. I've been through this one 15 times because I got bitterness. And uh, so hopefully you guys take pictures of those. And again, like Charlie was saying, this is a resource that you guys can keep for the rest of your life. Pride, bitterness, and idols of the heart are going to be one of those things that spring up over and over and over again until Jesus comes to get us. And what was the last part of the Christian life? Justification, sanctification, and glorification. So until we're glorified, we're going to be struggling with those. So hopefully we get a handle of that and notice it more and more and more. Done. All right. All right, well, good morning. Um, so today, as we said, our focus is on a demonstrate, demonstrate God's transforming grace, a changed view of God. And I actually, I will skip through this because we sort of covered it, but I do want to point out one thing. So first of all, we are doing demonstrate, and there's a sense in which we might say, what does this have to do with local outreach? Because really the focus of what we are doing, the reason why we have this all church Sunday school class is, is to... Um, is to um, help fulfill our goal as a church to um, just to pursue and focus on local outreach, reaching other people that we know in our community, in our families, or whatever. Um, so what, we talk about receive because, of course, if we don't know the gospel, we can't share the gospel. Demonstrate. Um, it's one thing that's interesting about demonstrate. I think is when you first hear the word demonstrate the gospel, we think like, well, we should, you know. Be kind, speak kind words, share, help people, etc. Right, which are all which is all true. But what you'll notice is in these three sessions that we have is there really is a heart focus because of course it really is the focus of our heart. Um, it's it's our heart that believes the gospel. It's our heart that the Holy Spirit transforms and brings to life. It's out of the our heart, the overflow of our heart, that our mouth speaks. And so that's why the focus is there. And so it's not so much to ignore specific actions. In fact, I think as we talk each one of these weeks, all of these things result in certain actions and interactions with other people. But it's interesting to me that a great demonstration of true gospel penetration into a heart is that changed heart. So transforming grace, the change. And I did want to just touch on through Jesus Christ. And this is because for me, it's a little convicting in the sense when I get super excited about some subject, um, whatever it is, even it's like talking about the character of God himself, or I'm talking about myself and my, like, look at how God has, you know, worked in my life, or I've been blessed by the Lord. I'll sometimes sort of take it for granted that it is, it comes through Jesus Christ. Uh, when we talk about the gospel, it's not just that God is kind, he's patient, he's forgiving, he is gracious, which is all true, but it's not just God is gracious and so he says, I forgive you. Right? He set this thousand, multi-thousand year plan into action so that he could be gracious to us, that he could demonstrate his love, he could demonstrate his grace through Jesus Christ. And since we've been looking, I've been looking at you know, the Gospel of John lately, this stuck out to me. It's, this is part of the prologue at the beginning. It says, the word became flesh, Jesus, and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. From his fullness, we have received grace. Great, we have received grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. So as we get into this, 
I always forget, like from my testimony perspective, I will, I mean, I don't like leave Jesus out of it exactly, but, but it occurs to me that I take for granted the background in my mind that I know that the Lord is gracious. You know, if he has given us Jesus Christ, what would he withhold? What more won't, what won't he give us? But it's that step that other people aren't going to understand. And one of the things that we are going to cover today is how we have this view of God. We understand who God is through the Holy Spirit that others don't yet. All right, I wanted to start with a quick story. So you may know this man. This is Martin Luther when he's young and Martin Luther when he's old and discerning eyes might notice that his eye color changed. I don't know how that happened, all right? <laughs> but, but the point is this, is I just wanted to think briefly, we're not gonna go through the Martin Luther story because it would be too long, but how did Martin Luther view God and how did his view of God change and how did that impact his life? That's really what I wanna talk about. And um, I know his fingers are funny too and they, they almost, it's like AI, right? I'm thinking of the five fingers. <laughs> I heard, um, I heard somebody say that when he was buried, his hand was a little bit curled up because he wrote so much all the time. Anyway, so as you may know, so Martin Luther was born in uh, 1483. So like Columbus is about to, you know, discover the new world, you know, Michelangelo is getting ready to paint. All these things are happening at the same time. But as Martin Luther reaches age, um, it's partly his culture, it's partly his own makeup that, that God gave him, but he was, um, he, he was really concerned about his soul. So just to really cut to the chase, he was very concerned about his soul and he was looking for what can I do? And there's the famous time where like lightning struck and he vowed, I'm going, you know, I'm gonna go serve the Lord. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check into the monastery. And he chose like one of, the, one of the strict ones because he knew that he was in trouble. He didn't know what to do about it. And so he followed whatever track people could offer him. You know, the penance, um, self-flatulation, they kind of said where you kind of beat yourself or wear a hairy cloak or whatever. But he did whatever he could do, but he could not find relief. There was a story that I heard, and I was trying to look it up, and I can't find it, that he was sort of, one of the things that sort of traumatized him, he, was walk, he would walk by a statue or a carving or a painting of Jesus with a sword. Because one of the ways they would portray Jesus is like the last judgment. He would have the sword, angels would be coming with him, and that sort of thing. And he would see Jesus as terrifying. He's coming. He's got his sword. Judgment is sure. What am I going to do? And so he would see, and that's, you know, that's part of the reason why Mary starts becoming a, you know, a, a thing in Roman Catholicism is because Jesus is, he's a little bit set apart, he's stern, but if we get to his mom, then, you know, and so on. So the point is this, he, um, so his focus was on how can I be made right with God? And so he goes through like 1505, uh, 1510, 1515, he goes through like 10 plus years of what am I going to do? And he had other work to do, I suppose. But when you're really concerned about God is this just judge and his righteousness is the standard, you tend to focus on yourself. You tend to focus on yourself. And, um, you know, and, and I'm just gonna read two quotes that maybe some of you have heard, but as he's reflecting back on this, when he's reading Romans 1.17, um, that says, you know, there's the, the right, the gospel, I should have written it down now, I can't recall it exactly, oh no. But anyway, the righteousness of God, like, is, somebody help me. Or we, God, I know revealed. Revealed. God has revealed his, no, that's, that's the next one. Oh, anyway, yeah. look it up for me. But he's reflecting on the righteousness of God because he sees the gospel. It says the God, it's talking about the gospel and right, God's righteousness is given, you know, in the gospel. And, and he's like, could you read it? And I'll repeat it. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live. Right, for, for in it, in the gospel, um, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And he's like, I can't keep the law. How can I keep the gospel? And this is the quotes. It says, I hated the word righteousness of God, which according to the use and custom of all the teachers, I had been taught to understand philosophically regarding the formal or act of righteousness, as they call it, with which God is righteous and he punishes the unrighteous sinner. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I didn't love, yes, I even hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. If I can't keep the law, how can I keep the gospel? How's this good news? And then, he, you know, as he's studying and he reads Augustine and all these things, he, he, comes, he comes to understand that this right, I'll read what he says, at last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, it is um, in, it, in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. 
there I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous life lives um, by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness, which the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. And here I felt that I was altogether born again and entered into paradise as if through open gates. But he basically says, I realize it's not the righteousness of God who judges righteously. It's the righteousness earned by Jesus Christ that he gives to us. And so now I am free. So anyway, the point is this. He no longer sees God as a harsh judge, but as a loving father. He doesn't see Jesus as a terrifying mediator, but as a gracious savior who's interceding for his people. He doesn't see the gospel as a threat, as something you've got to do, but a promise. Okay? And so what effect does this have on a life? Um, and, you know, and again, he was, goes on to be productive. One of the quotes that I remember somebody saying about, about Luther is he, he would say, God doesn't need your good works. Like, do good works, but God doesn't need your good works. Your neighbor does. And so the effect of us resting in the grace of God, in other words of saying, knowing who God is, having a true view of God, the effect of that is that we don't have to spend our lives worrying about how can I satisfy God? How can I please God? How can I keep myself out of punishment? I can start focusing, I can start focusing on serving my neighbor, loving my neighbor. Does that make sense? So anyway, just keep that in mind. The point is that we're, the whole point of the, of the message today is that um, your view of God um, determines how you live, of course. And one of the great ways that you can confirm in your own heart, right, you can look at your life and say like, if you're looking for assurance, am I one of God's children? What is your view of God like? Can you, can you think of how your view of God has changed? And so one of the part is we, when we get into the discussion, that's going to be included in this. Like we're gonna consider how has your view of God changed over time? This could be, you know, before you, you believed versus after you believed, before you were justified, after you were justified, before you were given a new heart, after you were given a new heart, or like all of us, and I'm sure Martin Luther included, right? Over time, as God sanctifies us, we learn, we're instructed by God himself and our view, we start to understand what does it mean that God is holy? What does it mean that God is kind and forgiving? What does it mean that God is faithful? And all of these things we progressively understand more and more deeply. And when you really understand that, that should really shape the way that you, uh, that, that, that you look. Think in your mind, like, if you're gonna be, a, this is one of the questions, if you're gonna be a man on the street interview with somebody and you were to say, tell me your view about God, what do you think God's like? What do you think people would say? There's all kinds of, of, of people, right? And so there's all kinds of distortions, you could say, of um, views of God. Um, and one of the things that kind of struck me this week is that, kind of getting back to my original <laughs> statement, is we can take for granted what people know about God, what they believe about God, because the fact is that we, um, we don't know God. We can't really know God until God reveals himself to us. And this um, section here, I wonder if I wrote it down. Oh yeah, yeah. So I wanna share like part, so part of 1 Corinthians 2, Paul is talking about, he's just reflecting on the fact that don't be wise in your own eyes. You don't know God except how, except how he reveals himself to you. And the powers that be don't know God because he hasn't, until he reveals himself. So let me just read this and think about that. And my point here is really just to consider when we encounter people, well, when we think back on ourselves about how God has dealt with us and then we encounter other people, don't take for granted that they know the true God. Know that they're gonna have a distorted, we all have a distorted view, but without faith, we haven't been given the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't know God. And listen to what this says. Um, these things, he's really talking about the gospel, but in general, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. The spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him. So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So think about that. No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Just before this is that section where, where, where Paul says, look, if the rulers of this age understood what God was doing in Jesus Christ, they never would have crucified him. Um, it, Cause and he quotes Isaiah, he says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, no, the heart of man has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So, so usually we think like, well, I can't wait to see what God has prepared for me. And that's not a bad application. But I think from Isaiah's perspective, he's saying, you can't imagine how incredible the new covenant is going to be when the Messiah comes. Nobody can even understand it. We can't get it unless God reveals it to us. 
So one of the things to be excited about is that God is teaching you who he is, and that by itself is, is glorious. Now we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is from God that we might understand things freely given us by God. Right, he's talking about the understanding. So um, the natural person doesn't accept the things of God for their folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. And then at the bottom, who has understood the mind of the Lord to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The whole point here, though, is just that what a gift it is that accompanying, we're not just saved from our sin. We're not just rescued from wrath. We're not just adopted into the family of God, but he's given us the Holy Spirit who teaches. And it's an interesting, I always thought it was an interesting phrase that who could understand the thoughts of a man except the spirit in him and God and all that. But the idea, the most important thing is that God has revealed his character, his behavior, his actions, his his attitude toward people, and he's revealed his, his plans, the glorious things that he has prepared for his people. Okay, so we depend on God is really the point. And so here's what we're going to do. is I'm going to just take, take three characteristics of God, which I think are pr particularly relevant to outreach, but you can do this with other attributes or behaviors or attitudes or work that God's done. So the first one is going to be holiness. So... I don't know, for, for a definition of holiness as it applies to God, I'm going with separateness, otherness, creatorness. But the idea is this, is that God, as God, is different than all of his creation. I mean, there's two things in the world. There's God and there's everything else, right? God created, the rest of everything, including us, is creation. And so the difference between like Michael the archangel and I don't know, a bug, I can't think of anything, right? You know, is is, is smaller than the difference between Michael and God himself, in a sense, right? God is totally different. It's, that's the idea, okay? And so, and as we go through this, think about, um, think about what it means for you, of course, but also think about what it means for understanding the gospel and as we, as we talk to people. So, I, so here's just some, some, here's my thoughts, right? So part of the holiness of God is taking God seriously. And here's just a few thoughts. The first one is, we believe God above all other things. So I'm mixing some other things in. But we believe God. We believe what he says. When we hear something out of the Bible, we, um, if we don't understand it, our first reaction is, I don't understand this. God, help me. Or I don't understand this. I wonder what's going on. And especially when we get to more difficult things, like, um, you know, think of objections people have to Christianity or to the actions or character of God himself. Think of things like, you know, well, how could he send the Israelites in to kill every man, woman, and child in, of the Canaanites, right? That can't, I can't believe in a God like that. But understanding um, holiness, having a real fear of God, our attitude isn't just like, well, whatever, God said it, I believe it. It may be a struggle, right? We can really not understand in detail certain things, but we should always say, man, I don't understand it. What's wrong with me? Or what don't I understand? Or where's my limitation? Um, and we are, we're first to say, God knows what he's doing. We, well, here's what I know. I know God is good. I know that he's wise. I know that he's holy. Um, I don't get everything. But it, the question is, where does your heart go? Which direction does it go? Does it go like, I can't believe you do this, versus I don't understand, but you know, but I trust you. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's one aspect of understanding his character. A second thing would be honoring his name above all other, all others, all other things. Um, one of the things that just strikes me is what does it sound like when the Lord's name is disrespected? Or I mean, just what does it sound like? How does it hit your heart? And again, think maybe before and after either conversion or before and after you're kind of going through this process. Like when you hear people, you know, swearing or kind of, you know, that sort of thing, or you're watching a movie or something, it's like there's a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a piercing in the heart. It's no longer a joke. Or there's like things like, like TV shows or things where Jesus becomes a punchline for something, right? And there's even a sense in which part of, I mean, look, well, this is me. I don't know. Part of me says, well, I can see why that's a funny joke, kind of. But this isn't something to be joking about. I mean, this is the, this is the man God who gave himself for me. I mean, this isn't, it's not, he's not a joke. It's not funny, right? And so, um, and it even applies to things, in fact, just last night we were driving home, we heard a country song which was, part of the chorus was like, send a prayer to the man upstairs. It's like, you know, that's not, that's not treating God as holy, right? The man upstairs, the grandpa guy, or whatever. He's not a buddy, but he is, he is God. So anyway, 
A second thing about holiness would be honoring um, his name above all others. And then the last thing is, you know, fearing God, which has to do um, with hearing what he says. Like we, we hear his word, we submit to what he says. It's our desire to obey, you know, mostly, <laughs> except when it's not, except when we're tempted and pulled in different directions. But you know what it's like, speaking of like a transformed heart, you know what it's like when you want to do something that you know is sin. And you've got this pull. It's like, I, but I can't. I, but it's more than I, I shouldn't. It's like, sometimes it's, he's been so good. Why would, I, why would I do this? Sometimes it's, you know, Jesus died for my sin. Do I really want to put this one on the pile of things that he is suffering the wrath of God for? I don't know. There's different ways that we think about it. But when you have this true view of God, you know, Sin and righteousness isn't a joke, right? It's, it's, you know, it's kind of serious, serious business. And so when we fear God, he and his glory starts to become key in our minds. And other things, even our greatest interests, hobbies, sports, um, goals and like life dreams, things like that, we still have them, but they start to fade in, in the importance when contrasted with God himself. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. But... What we're talking about here is um, our view of God changes. When we understand who he is, like in his holiness, it has a real impact. The second one is kindness, the kindness of God. And again, one, each, each of us have distorted views of God in different ways. Non-believers have more, you know, very distorted views in different ways. And some people see God as the stern judge, like Martin Luther, or maybe other religious people. And, other, and they need, well... I guess that they need to understand God's kindness. <laughs> Other people think of God as just, I don't know, he forgives everything, whatever. They need to understand his holiness. Anyway, um, God's kindness, God's kindness. So when we think of kindness, um, we might also think of it in terms of like his benevolence, his fatherly care, uh, tender care. Um, and the question is, is what's God's attitude toward the world in general? If somebody were to ask you like, well, what does God think about people? What's his attitude toward people? You know, think about like what you would, how you would respond. And while God's, to, to, to try to like lump, it, lump, lump his attitude into one adjective, you know, is obviously simplistic. Um, there are certain emphases that the Bible gives. And I think, you know, God, I want to read you some scripture that I think are in the notes. I, sh I should have references to these in the notes. But um, God's disposition, especially as we stand here in this age of grace, is kindness, benevolence, reaching out. In fact, there's some striking language that's used. So the first one I want to read is, um, oh, actually, I'll, so Exodus 34, 6. This is when the people have sinned by worshiping the golden calf, and Moses intercedes, and after the intercession, Moses says, God, show me, show me your glory. And God says, well, I can't show you everything, but I'm going to stick you in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to walk by. And what does God show him? It's not really a visual as much as it is he declares his name. He says, the Lord, the Lord. Um, I can't remember. This is why I should write this stuff down. A God gracious and mer merciful, slow to anger. Um, I did write down. And abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, right? But when God wants to reveal himself, take Moses to the pinnacle of his glory. And it does go on and say, but, you know, for those who hate me and so on. But when he goes to the pinnacle of his glory, um, he goes to merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Right? That's who God reveals himself to be when he uses the name the Lord or, or Yahweh. Right? His personal name is not just his own existence, but it's, it's, this, it's this sovereign care for his people. So there's a few places where you I mean, there's probably a bunch, but the, the passage here in Titus really struck me. So think about God's kindness. What does it say about God? Titus 3, starting in... Uh, Verse 3, it says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. Right? Very low. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy. And so it's, just a sh it's, it's one of these many places where we are in such a bad way. And what prompts God to do this for his people. His graciousness, his character, his grace, his mercy, his loving kindness, his steadfast love. So it should be super encouraging. I think I put in the notes Luke 15. Um, do I have it even here? 
Oh yeah, kindness to those who don't deserve it, right? This is what, this is really what grace, grace is. Luke 15 is my favorite chapter. I think it, I'm officially gonna say it's my favorite chapter in the Bible because I always keep coming back to it. I can't get over it, right? Because what, th what this talks about is the, the heart of the father who goes after what's lost, his people. The shepherd finds the lost sheep and he doesn't just find it and say, stop it, don't do that again, get back here. Right, that would be enough. It makes me think of like when James, what is it, I keep saying these things that I should memorize better. But when James says, if anyone acts, lacks wisdom, let him ask God, okay, but who gives generously without reproach. And I love that part. It's like, keep asking, because God's not gonna say, oh, you asked for it yesterday. He wants to give, he wants to give. It's, it's really hard to wrap our minds about around this long suffering, this patience and kindness of God, because we're not like that, right? We have this like limit where it's like, you know what it's like to, to receive something from somebody and they're, you're finally getting the eye roll. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm, fortunately I'm patient, so I'm gonna keep, keep uh, hang on, I'm getting off, I'm getting off script. The point, the point is this, is that this kindness here is done with this heart of just, I want you back, I'm gonna do what it takes to get you back, and when you come back, I'm gonna rejoice, I'm gonna forgive perfectly so that you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that I was ever, I mean, maybe mad or is the wrong word, but that there was ever anything between us, we will be reconciled, peace, shalom. And especially, you know, the lost son, the prodigal son, when the son comes back, there is zero hesitation. The father brings him back, all wrongs are forgiven. And, you know, the, the older brother as well, the father, he speaks kindly, he speaks compassionately, he wants to win the heart of even that older brother who's been good all the time. Okay, and, and when you watch Jesus talk to people, he talks to the lowest people with grace and kindness. He talks to the most respectable people with grace and kindness as he tries to bring them to himself. And there's, and there's, and there's many more. Um, Zephaniah is a good one where God's singing over us. I, can't, I don't have time to read that. Hosea, there's a bunch of these prophets that are like this. I love this, I can't have to read some of this in Hosea 11. Um, this is kind of at the end. So remember, we've been doing minor prophets. He sends prophets to just tell him, look, this is horrible. What you're doing stinks in my sight. This cannot be abided. You will be driven out, etc." Hosea 11, near the end of the book, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them by their arms. They didn't know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke of their jaws. I bent down to them to feed them. Right? It's really, it's really a beautiful picture of God's kindness, his benevolence toward his people. In verse eight it says, how can I give you up, o, o Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Agma, or how can I treat you like Zebulun? My heart recoils within me, my compassion grows warm and tender. When you think of God's character, do you think of that kind of passion, emotion for his people? So anyway, what a great thing to communicate to people. It's a great thing to meditate on because until I, to, until I was studying this stuff this week and I say it out loud, it's like, that's better than I thought, <laughs> you know? And on paper, when, you're, when, you're, when you haven't articulated it clearly, when it's just a general like, God is gracious, it's like, that's nice. But when you start to really meditate on what that actually means in real life over real time in real situations, it can make your heart explode, all right? Oh, and, and then Jen, again, Jesus is the, the, a great example of this kindness because we can actually see it with flesh and blood, right? One of the great things about the Lord Jesus coming into the world and living a full life is we can read about what God does, but he always seems kind of other, otherly, right, in the Old Testament because it's God and then he's got his people. But Jesus walks in among his people. He speaks to Nicodemus, who I think is probably having a similar deal as Martin Luther. Like, I've got everything. I am at the top. And Jesus says, you gotta be born again, you can't do anymore. But he, so he speaks kindly to Nicodemus, he speaks kindly to the woman at the well, he speaks kindly to the rich young ruler who is self-righteous, uh, and, and so on. If you go through all the whole list, high or low, he never gets bent out of shape, right? He reacts to pride, and he's, he is stern when he needs to be, but what is it, a flickering wick he won't, uh, he won't put out, right? So anyone who comes to him, he speaks kindly, okay. That's the kindness of God. The third one, this is our last one, is God's faithfulness. And so faithfulness is to be reliable, steadfast, unwavering. 
And faithfulness is one of the fruit of the spirit, right? These are one of the things that we ought to cultivate in ourselves, but we're talking about the character of God, okay? And so in the case of, of God, first of all, understand, like, how do we know that God is faithful? Or how do we know that God keeps every promise that he makes? And the first is his proven faith, faithfulness through history. And this is where I could, I could go on for kind of quite a while. But I'm going to go on a little while because, like I said, when we hear it again, when we look at what happens in details, instead of talking about the abstract word, it could get you, you know, pretty excited. So the, the best example, a great example of the faithfulness of God is in the life of Abraham, right? Because he calls Abraham and he makes a promise to him. He says, I will, you know, take you to this land. Um, you will be a blessing to all the nations. I'm going to give you offspring. And especially as you read the promises that he reiterates to Abraham, the offspring one gets bigger and bigger. So to the point when Abraham is like, you know, 99, he's like, he gives, or actually, he's, he's not quite that old yet, but he's getting older. He still doesn't have any kids. And, Ab and God says, all right, Abram, I'm going to name you Abraham. I'm going to make you exceedingly fruitful. I'm going to make you into nations. Kings will come to you. I mean, this is like a big offspring promise, right? He's like, if you thought it was just going to be like a little bit, no, no, this, I'm going to blow the doors off of this. I will establish a covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. Oh, no. I'm not used to this thing, although I do like it a lot. I'm going to put it down. I don't play with it. Um, but he makes, basically he makes, he reiterates this process and like this seemed impossible, right? In fact, by the time God came back again and says, all right, next year you're going to have a, you know, a son, seems impossible, right? But God's faithfulness, you know, God is faithful even through situations that seem impossible because not only is God trustworthy, not only is it his will to keep his promise, but he has the power to do so. And of course, at 100 years old and at 90 for Sarah, they have Isaac, the son of the promise. And then, of course, as you know, sometime later, God says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go sacrifice at the place that I tell you. And it, it's very, it, how could this be? I mean, this is, this is even more impossible sounding. And Hebrews, like when, when Abraham raises the knife to slaughter his one and only son of promise, who God promised would be like, um, from kings would come from, nations would come from, the nations would be blessed through him. He raises the knife. And this is what Hebrew says, was, this is what was in his mind. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac, and he had received the prom And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was even able to raise the dead, from which figuratively he did. Right? Abraham didn't know, but he's like, if God says it, I'm going to do it, because God could raise him from the dead. God's faithfulness, and God was faithful, and through Isaac, you know, the nation was born. And if you read through Exodus, it was so cool that, you know, why did God save his people? Well, it's not because he felt bad for them. It's not because they were like down and out in slavery in Egypt. It says that he heard their cry and um, God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God saw the people and he knew. And he reiterates this again later on. Like when Moses is interceding, remember the people sinned greatly. Moses intercedes for the people and he appeals. He says, God, you made this promise to Abraham and to the people, right? And Moses knew that God was faithful and God proved himself to be faithful. Every time it seems like it's over, God somehow does the impossible. He pulls the, hat, or the rabbit out of the hat and he proves himself to be faithful. In Deuteronomy, it says this. Um, this is Deuteronomy chapter seven, starting in verse six. And there's a reason why I'm reading this. I was telling the boys, I don't know if I'll have time to read this, but I'm reading it. Um, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of the peoples. But it's because the Lord loves you and he's keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. You get that? So it's partly he loves you and it's he is being faithful to his promise that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of slavery from the from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So the point, the point is this, is that God is faithful and he kept all of these promises to his people and he kept all of these promises in Jesus Christ, right? All of these are really pointing forward to Jesus, right? He, you know, 
he promised to your offspring, I will give all of this stuff. And he kept that in Jesus, his offspring. He, he promised a, pro a prophet like Moses is going to rise up among you. He kept that promise in Jesus Christ. He said a priest like you from the order of Melchizedek is going to come. And he kept that promise. A king in David's line, he promised. And in fact, if you look at Solomon, he keeps saying, you know, just like he promised to my dad, just like he promised to my dad. Um, and then finally, he promised this new covenant in water to cleanse, in the Holy Spirit who regenerates, kept by Jesus and sealed in his blood. And so God has proven faithful in history. And that was the longest bullet that we have, so we're going to finish up. <laughs> but think about this. So God has totally been proven himself faithful even in the most impossible situations. But you should be able to look back on your life and say, well, how has God been faithful to me? And I won't quote anything out of the Bible for this because this is your life. <laughs> so this is something we can do in the discussion time, but has God proven himself to be faithful to you? And think about how in detail, and that is a great thing to add to your testimony. And then the last thing I want to point out about this, the, the thing about God's faithfulness, besides just being kind of exciting, is our assurance as his people that we're going to persevere to the end depends on God's faithfulness. He's proven his faithfulness so that we can, we can rest assured. And again, going back to sort of the Martin Luther example, it's, not, it's one thing to feel like I've got to, I've got to um, claw my way into God's good graces, but I don't have to hang on either, right? That's the, kind of the back end of, of justification. God is going to preserve us. And just a few quotes. I included Deuteronomy because 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says this, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I love that verse because that's how God talked about Israel. God made all of these promises to Israel, and now he's talking to me like that, right? So that, what that means is, was he faithful to Israel? Is he going to be faithful to me? I mean, in the same way, he is going to be faithful to, to his people. I love, love, love that. Romans 8.28 says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, of course. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. These are all in the notes, I think. 1 John 1, 9, great verse. We, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that amazing? He's faithful, right? It's, it's, it's his own character to be righteous and just and faithful to cleanse us if we confess our sins. And there are some more. But I'm going I'm to move on to our last slide here. What does this have to do with outreach? So here's what the point is, is that we, our faith is demonstrated by this change of heart which re results in a changed view of God. Think through, again, how your view of God has changed over time. How has God you know, made that change for you over time? Realize that people you're talking to aren't there yet, right? They don't have the Holy Spirit to teach you, and they don't have other means that God might be using. They might have some, but... They don't have the spirit who's the real teacher here. Okay, so a couple of things impacting your outreach. First of all, know that God is for you. Okay, this touches on his kindness, um, patience, and forgiveness. But if you're like me, you know, you're in sin of some kind, and you kind of almost feel like doing a little bit of self-penance, right? It's like, well, okay, well, I'm like this right now. You know, I can't, I'm, I'm going to stay away from the Bible for a little while because that's a little holy, I'm a little unholy. Or, you know, I gotta, I'll give myself some sort of little punishment, right? That is not what the Word of God tells us to do, right? What, what, is, what is the, if we are in sin, what is the way for us to be sort of reconciled again with the Lord? What does the Bible tell us to do? Repent. Repent, yep, confess your sins. He's faithful, he's just. And literally, and again, Luke, I don't know if I put in any verses in here, but Luke 15 again is so awesome. The minute that sun comes back, Scoops them back up again. The minute that sheep is found, scoops back up in love, right? You don't have to stay away. You don't have to be perfect. Part of up here is you don't have to be perfect in order to be a witness to somebody else, right? In fact, it can, it, you, can, you can help explain to people, you know, like who was it? Who was it that said that? I don't know if it was you, Dave. But there was a, oh, it was Denny and Wayne, I think. Whoever it was, there was a guy that came in off the street, and he's like, talking to Denny and Wayne after church. So I was like, well, I don't know. I can't really come to church. I can't be holy like you guys. <laughs> like Denny and Wayne are like all oh. <laughs> us. So anyway, my point is, is that don't let your sin um, keep you from outreach, right? You can, you, you, you repent. Um, and, and, well, yes. 
So you know God and tell others, and this has been the main point that I've been trying to make. You have this knowledge. Don't take for granted how awesome that is, okay? Um, that you've been taught this. Enthusiastically present that truth to people how great God is. There is nobody, you gotta make sure people understand his kindness. There's nobody who's, who is so bad that God is not willing or able to, to save. And there is nobody who is too great and powerful that nobody's willing to save, right? God, God can and will, and he delights to do that. Explain why you serve him even when you're suffering. If you know who God is and that he's faithful, even when you're suffering, you have a testimony. Okay, and then lastly, um, God is sovereign trust in. The Lord Jesus gave you know, directions. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go out and make disciples. Okay, so we have that behind him. We have 2 Corinthians. This is, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish with this. But <coughs> listen to this and think about what this is saying about your role in reaching out to other people. This is 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Like Paul's talking about him and his band. Like Christ um, has reconciled us to him, and now he's given us the ministry of reconciliation to bring people to him. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Here's the verse. Therefore, we're ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. Right? The God of the universe, the creator God, isn't shouting down from heaven. He's making his appeal to people to, just like, you know, well, I'm trying to think of a good example. He's making his appeal to people. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. It's like God is imploring people, come to me, come to me. Why would you not come to me? You know, my heart, you know, my heart is reaching out towards you. I have the power, I have the ability, I have the disposition. Come to me. And I'm not gonna say that God is begging people to come to him, because that wouldn't really be right. But as his ambassadors, we are reaching people in God's way, reaching out with this pleading, this, I don't know, this pleading. <laughs> that's, all I, that's, all I, that's all I can do. So I think, okay, that is it. So the main, the main point is, consider your view of God. How has it changed? How does that impact the way that you think about God and you live your life? But also, how does it impact the way you would reach out to other people? How would you explain those things to other people? Um, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's good. So let's, let's pray, and we'll have some discussion time, okay? <coughs> Father, it is an amazing treasure that you've given us, not just in your word, but in your spirit, whom you've given us to, um, to teach us. What would we know about you if you didn't teach us? And so, you know, I thank you. I thank you um, for the joy that you give us in just knowing you. Um, it says that eternal life is this, is knowing God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, we know you, so let us not take that for granted. And help us to really work at um, being able to answer back to the hope that's in us. We know what a great God you are. Help us to articulate that, to clarify that, to, to really know it deep in our bones so that it just comes out of every pore. And so when we talk to someone, we can really help explain, maybe not perfectly, but we can, we can give them a taste of what the joy that it is to know you. So Father, we can't do that without you, so ask for your help in Jesus' name, amen.